as has been mentioned, this is our annual W.H. Griffith Thomas Lectureship Week, where we have the privilege of inviting evangelicals from uh, uh, around the world to uh, come and spend a week with us and deliver to us a series of lectures that are designed to expand our minds, uh, expand our hearts, to give us a new perspective from uh, the different disciplines that God has used uh, in ministry around the world. Uh, our speaker this week is Dr. Michael J. Anthony, who's research professor of educational studies at Talbot School of Theology, uh, but he doesn't live in California. For 27 years, he held that appointment at Talbot in the School of Theology, teaching courses in leadership, organizational development, and nonprofit management. He also served in a variety of administrative appointments, including department chair, associate provost, and vice provost. He now serves as research professor of educational studies, but he's also an adjunct professor at Denver Seminary, Capital Seminary, and Dallas Seminary. He earned a PhD from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Educational Administration, and another PhD from Claremont Graduate uh, University in Developmental Psychology, a double doc. In addition to serving on staff in five local churches, he served for 11 years as the senior chaplain for the Irvine Police Department. He currently serves as the chief operating and finance officer at Dream Centers in Colorado Springs. He's authored uh, or edited 13 books, including works such as Evangelical Dictionary of Christian Education, Management Essentials for Christian Ministries. He's been married to his wife, Michelle, for 30 years. They have two adult children. Dr. Anthony, thank you for spending the time in prep and uh, the time that you devoted to come here. Uh, we welcome you to Dallas Seminary. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Anthony to our class here? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is indeed a privilege and an honor for me to be here with you today. I'd like to extend my sincere appreciation to the Departments of Christian Education, Christian Leadership, for, and also, of course, our Academic Dean, Dr. Mark Yarborough, for that invitation. When Dr. Yarborough called and asked me back in April of last year if I would come and be your speaker, uh, I looked up a few of your past speakers, Dr. Swindoll, Dr. Moeller, Dr. Wolford. It was uh, a little intimidating, to say the least. Having been a seminary professor now for close to 35 years and having graduated as a student from three seminaries, I began to think, what do I have to say? What can I possibly say that you haven't already heard before by individuals far more acclaimed and scholarly than myself? So I began to pray, Father, is this where you want me to be? Is, is, is there a word that you would have me speak that they haven't possibly heard? I mean, think. Remember, Michael, what it was like as a seminary student. You've, I filled my days, as you do now, memorizing names and dates and cities and events with a head stuffed full of facts and figures that one day I thought I could never get another word in there. I began to pray, Father, as a student, I knew so much about you in my head, but I knew so little about you as I do now in my heart. And I heard God say, exactly. So I chose, I believe, with the prompting of the Holy Spirit, the theme this week, the heart of God. What is the heart of God? Well, today we'll talk about and expound a bit of an exegesis on the biblical heart, the biblical theology of the heart of God. Tomorrow, I'm going to meddle just a little bit as we talk about the heart of God in relationship to the, pre the, the preparation of the ministry leader. And, and I think I'm going to surprise you just a little bit how few ministry leaders in Scripture actually held formal theological training. So what is it in God's heart that helps prepare men and women for ministry leader and leadership? Uh, the next day we'll talk about the heart of God in relationship to social engagement a topic very pertinent to where we live in our country today. And then lastly, the heart of God in relationship to the church, which I assume most of you are committing your life to. Would it be nice to know what is the heart of God in relationship to that? But first today, let's talk a little bit about a biblical theology of the heart of God. 
Now, I begin this analysis with a rather hefty dose of personal skepticism and reality. I mean, think for a moment what it is I'm trying to do. To spend four days expounding an understanding of the heart of God. How utterly presumptuous of me. As if a finite human being could know such a thing. That God, the creator of this expanse of the universe, he who formed the stars, the planets, the solar system, could be known and understood at that level of engagement. <laughs> How preposterous. Yet, if it is true that God, the same one that formed the universe and the details of this world in which we live, also created mankind and then invited him to walk in a garden and have fellowship with him, it stands to reason that he wants to be known, at least to some degree and at some level. Throughout human history, God has spoken to man, has involved himself in man's governmental structures, and intercedes in his plans and is ultimately in control of the final events of his life on this earth. He provides us with a written record that documents his relationship with mankind. This book also serves to guide us in our relationship with one another. Yes, God does de desire for us to know him. And through this exchange, we get a glimpse into his motives, his desires, and yes, I believe ultimately, his heart. The study of anthropomorphism is the assignment of human attributes to non-human entities. The use of human terminology to talk about God is necessary when we, in our own limitations, wish to express truths about the deity who, by his very nature, cannot be described or known in great detail. For example, and you may want to jot down a few of these references as I walk through some examples in Scripture. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 tells us that Adam and Eve recognized the sound of God walking in the garden. Genesis 8, 21 tells us that God smelled the aroma of the sacrifice after the flood. Genesis 16, 12 declares that God sees his people. John 9.31 tells us that God hears the prayers of the sinner. There are 122 references in Scripture that speak of God's hand. So in this frame of reference, this is what we're speaking about when we speak of God having a heart. The question we examine when we study the various passages related to his heart is what does it tell us about how God uses his heart when making decisions? How does the heart of God frame his values, his priorities, or perhaps his judgments? The friend I have recently died when his heart stopped pumping. Well, it really wasn't his heart. Uh, he actually had received a heart transplant. In fact, at one point, uh, he was the longest living heart transplant patient in the United States. And then eventually even that heart gave out. This series is not about that kind of heart. It's not a discussion about an organ that pumps blood throughout the body. It, it isn't a romantic, philosophical, or even a literary type of heart that we're talking about. Instead, the object of this conversation, this examination, is how does the Bible define and discuss the heart, specifically the heart of God? Here we're seeking to understand the broader concept of heart that which is the seat of values, priorities, and desires. So, obviously, we go to Scripture as our source of truth because Scripture tells us that our own heart can't be trusted. The Bible tells us that man's heart is evil, broken, and corrupt. Jeremiah 17.9 tells us that the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things and even beyond cure. Who could possibly understand it? In essence, due to the consequences of the fall, we can no longer rely on our own heart to define and translate or even explain the world around us. It is in some way tainted and distorted. It's no longer calibrated towards an accurate assessment. So let's set some parameters. Let's define some terms. 
My assigned task in this analysis is to develop a biblical theology of heart with you today. While many have sought to do so through a deductive approach, I prefer the textual grounding of an inductive model instead. I confess it also allows me my own personal bias of using a historical, grammatical, and hermeneutic. Listeners to this presentation and subsequent readers of any record, should you decide to publish this at, this at some point, as the jury may be out on that, are urged to understand that the necessary boundaries of this study allow for only a cursory overview, much like a stone sort of skipping across the surface of, a, of the water, just briefly touching down on a few salient passages. I make no claim to being comprehensive or exhaustive. What follows takes the outline of a biblical theology defined by Charles Ryrie as that branch of theological science which deals systematically with the historically conditioned progress of the self-revelation of God as posited in the Bible. The term heart, Hebrew levav, and Greek cardia, covers over 1,000 times in the Bible. There are 850 references to heart in the Old Testament. Don't worry, we won't cover them all today. In its most common form, lev, it occurs 598 times in the Hebrew Old Testament, and in the form of levav, 252 times, making it the most common anthropomorphic term in Scripture. Lewis Schaefer notes, the existence and the extensive use of the word heart and all of its varied implications places it in a position of extreme importance. It is almost exclusively applied to man, although in 26 Old Testament references, it refers to the heart of God. Regarding the Old Testament concept of heart, it can be broad, at times it can be all-encompassing. And while the majority of these verses, as I've said, refer to the heart of man, in 26 times do we find that it specifically identifies God's heart. And those are the references like that stone skipping down I'd like to explore with you. So let's explore the heart of God in the Pentateuch. Of the 91 references of heart in the Pentateuch, all but three of them are in reference to man's heart. One such verse that speaks directly of God's heart is found in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, where we read, The Lord was sore that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. This reference has caused a good deal of debate, no doubt in some of your classes. Relative confusion regarding the degree to which God can experience the human emotions of regret, grief, and repentance. This is clearly a challenging passage when brought to bear with cross-references such as Numbers 23, 19, where we read, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the Son of God that he should repent. Has he said and shall it not be spoken? Has he spoken and shall he, shall he not make it good? Or 1 Samuel 15, 29, also the glory of Israel will not lie or will not change his mind. For he is not a man that he should change his mind. Now, if you find yourself scratching your head trying to reconcile these texts, you're not alone. If we begin with the theological presuppositions that God is omniscient and also omnipotent, then we must conclude that what will occur in human history is already known to God and is therefore not a surprise to him when it happens. In essence, Things are immutable and foreordained. Now, given such a perspective, human emotions of grief, regret, and repentance seem improbable descriptors of God. However, if we start with the premise of man's free will, everything comes down to human choice and action. In this case, God's ability to experience grief, regret, and change of heart seem perhaps more plausible. One commentary author writing of this perplexity writes, acknowledging the emotions of God does not diminish the, excuse me, the immutability of his promissory purposes. Rather, his feelings and actions towards men, such as judgment and forgiveness, are always inherently consistent 
with his essential person and just and gracious resolve. One author seeks to bring these two, what seems like diametrically opposing concepts together. Perhaps one way to reconcile what is to some an apparent contradiction is espoused by the theologian John Calvin when he writes, the repentance which is here ascribed to God does not properly belong to him, but has reference to our understanding of him. For since we cannot comprehend him as he is, it is necessary that for our sakes he should, in a certain sense, transform himself. That repentance cannot take place in God easily appears from this single consideration that nothing happens which is by him unexpected or unforeseen. The same reasoning and remark applies to what follows, that God was affected with this grief. Certainly, God is not sorrowful or sad, yet because it is not otherwise known how great God is in terms of his hatred and detestation of sin, therefore the Spirit accommodates himself to our capacity to understand him. Wherefore, there's no need for us to involve ourselves in thorny and difficult questions when it is obvious to us what ends these words of repentance and grief are applied, namely, to teach us. To teach us what? This disdain for sin provides us with our first glimpse into the heart of God, one that reveals his holiness involvement in the affairs of human existence and inability to turn his back on sin whenever and wherever it occurs. Continuing on, in Genesis chapter 8, 21, we read, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. Never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have just done. Here again, we have this anthropomorphism similar to chapter 6, verse 6. The context of this particular verse regards God's heart comes to us post-flood. Noah has now transitioned into a desolate world. Having gone to great lengths to receive and care for the animals on the ark, he begins his new pilgrimage by worshiping God with animal sacrifice. Now, given all that God has done on his behalf, it would appear to me to be a rather wise beginning indeed. The offering of cattle is a sweet savor to God, and it reached his throne room. God reflects in his heart that is literally to himself about the current state of affairs on earth. He commits again to never drown mankind. This rendering of Levav reveals God's reasoning ability and deep-seated conviction of the heart. It's very important for us to understand this in relationship to humanity and his dealings with mankind. It's also noteworthy that God did not request this offering from Noah. Sacrifices pleasing to God are not bulls and goats, the psalmist says, but a contrite and broken spirit. What prompted this deep-hearted response from God himself? It was man's unpretentious and humble spirit. Now let's take a brief look at the heart of God in the historical books. The 12 books that comprise the historical books cover a large swath of history and contain some of the most important segments of the entire biblical narrative. And taken together, these books tell the story of an ancient Israel's formation, rise to prominence and collapse into moral and physical defeat and subsequent restoration. In this genre, we find 149 references to Lev or Levav. While most are in connection to man's heart, there are a few notable exceptions. A noteworthy reference to God's heart in this genre is found in the second chapter of the book of 1 Samuel, where the prophet known only as a man of God comes to the priest Eli. Eli is serving in the tabernacle in Shiloh, a city near the hill country of Ephraim. He delivers a rather dire message to Eli, informing him of God's severe displeasure, of him specifically, for the manner in which he has not exercised discipline over his two sons. 
It was foretold that Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, would both be struck down on the same day. As a result, the priesthood would pass from Eli's family to another. One would be more faithful and one whom would obey God's commands. At the end of this tirade of judgment, we read, But I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and also in my soul. And I will build him an enduring house, and he will walk before me in my anointed ways. Since this phrase, according to what is in my heart, could literally be translated according to my will and my desire, it gives us a glimpse into God's heart, demonstrating his desire for, for his servants that they operate as faithful representatives of his character and reputation and proclaim accurately and obediently his word and his commands. Similar in another passage that we find in the genre in 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 30, where Yahweh says to Jehu, because you have jealously carried out what is right in my eyes and entirely in my heart, your sons unto the fourth generation will sit on the throne of Israel. Here we see those who act according to what is in God's heart will receive God's favor. We also found in the book of 1 Samuel 13, 14, one of the more notable references in this regard, where we read that David is referenced as a man who seeks after God's heart. So how old was David when this was said of him? When he received his first anointing by Samuel. Evidently, one does not need to be a biblical scholar, a seminary graduate, or senior statesman in the ministry to seek after God's heart. Surely David knew what he was seeking after, and he was determined enough, even at a young age, to receive God's blessing and his affirmation for doing so. Now this passage begs the question, what does it mean to seek after God's heart? Well, perhaps the former Dallas Seminary President, Dr. Charles Swindoll, said it best when he said, it means your life is in harmony with the Lord. What is important to him is important to you. What burdens him burdens you. When he says, go to the right, you go to the right. When he says, stop that in your life, you take note and you stop it. When he says, this is wrong and I want you to change, you come to terms with it because you have the heart of God. Now, the heart of God in the wisdom literature. While many books of the Old Testament give us a historian's viewpoint of God's works, his relationship to mankind, the wisdom books provide us with a more pastoral glimpse at the state of their hearts. We see that despite the gap of time that separates us from ancient Israel, the Israelites grapple with the same faith issues that you and I deal with today. They ask tough questions about sin and suffering. They experience joy and confidence in God's love. They look for God in life's pleasures and also in God's trials alike. They sometimes entertain doubts and they look to God to help them both in their physical and spiritual conditions. We see throughout the wisdom literature a heavy emphasis on God's heart, specifically as it's being used to his reasoning and intellect rather than as a basis for emotion. It is highly significant that Lev or Levav occur far more frequently in the wisdom literature, 90 times in Proverbs alone and 42 times in Ecclesiastes. The book of Job gives us three specific references to God's heart. Perhaps it's no wonder given that this book is such a personal encounter between Job and God himself. This book is a lament of one man's pain and his, just, and his just journey to discover the cause and eventual remedy. Along the way, Job asks God a number of questions in his effort to bring calamity to an end. At one point in chapter 7, he asks, What is man that you magnify him, 
that you should set your heart on him? The Epicureans maintained that God paid no attention at all to this world or to anything that happened in it, but dwelt secure and tranquil off by himself in heaven with nothing to disturb, displeasure, or vex him. Job's juxtaposed perspective is a God who tenderly and fondly involves himself in the affairs of man and the deep affection that serves as the impetus for such a relationship. A few chapters later, Job reflects on this manner in which God had crafted him in his mother's womb, cared for his daily needs, and yet in some strange way purposed Job for this present series of personal calamities. In essence, Job is acknowledging the detailed manner in which God reasons, plans, and ordains the affairs of man's life in his heart. In other words, nothing happens to man by chance or arbitrary misfortune. Finally, in chapter 34, we have Elihu's defense of God's actions where he states, if he, that is God, should set his heart upon man, if he gathers to himself his, that is man's spirit and his breath, all humanity would perish together and mankind would return to the dust. Elihu affirms, God's ability to do whatsoever he pleases, since after all, he's God. In our last reference to God's heart found in this genre, we read in Psalm 33, verses 10 and 11, the Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples, but the plans of the Lord stand firm. The purposes of his heart throughout all generations. Here the author comes to realize that while the transient plans and determinations of man may pass and go, God is not subject to the emotions and whims that subjugate man's decision-making processes. Now the heart of God and the prophets. Regarding the heart heart of God, passages found in the Old Testament genre of the prophets, specifically four of them we find are consistent in their theme. These verses speak of God's intentional desire, his clear conviction and steadfast determination to bring to pass what he has planned. Let me read these verses for you. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come, Isaiah 63, 4. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has purposed and performed all that he has carried out, all from his heart. In the last days, then you will clearly understand. Jeremiah 23, 20. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has performed and until he has accomplished the intent of his heart. Jeremiah 30, 24. And finally, I will rejoice over them to do them good and will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. Jeremiah 32, 41. Now before moving on to the New Testament... In the discussion of Cardia, perhaps we should pause and summarize what we've discovered thus far in the 26 specific references to God's heart in the Old Testament. We know from these passages that references to God's heart are often stark in contrast to man's. While man's heart may be subject to emotional override or spontaneity, God's is not. Rarely do we find references to God's heart that forces or focuses on emotion or feelings. The majority of these verses speak of God's heart in terms of decisiveness, reason, and determination. Hans Wolf, in his anthology of the Old Testament, summarizes these passages by saying, correspondingly, God's levav and God's nefesh are spoken of here to attest to his steadfast will and his longing desire, in this case with regard to his plan for the future to which his whole will is completely committed. So in essence, once God is determined in his heart to do something, whether it's in the present or in the future, once God has purposefully done something in his heart and set it in place, it's as if it's already happened. When David is described as being a man who sought after God's heart, what is meant is David's determination to please God with his humility, contrite spirit, integrity, and wholehearted obedience. 
It was consistent with what we saw in post-flood Noah. Tenderness, humility, and the complete lack of pretense was their strength. We would do well to model ourselves after such a set of life values and priorities. Now, in the remainder of my time with you, let me just briefly skim over the heart of God in the New Testament. As we turn our attention to the heart of God in the New Testament, we face a challenging set of circumstances. We neither have a list of passages that specifically reference the heart of God as we had in the Old Testament. There's no cardia ton theos, so to speak. However, let it be known that God's heart is clearly revealed throughout the New Testament in the actions of Jesus, his son. His motives prompt his actions and the resulting lessons that could be interpreted while using just simple elementary techniques of critical thinking. To discern the heart of Jesus and the heart of God is found together throughout the pages. The heart of Jesus and the heart of his Father were knit together as one. Jesus' character and his priorities Those parties which determined his actions revealed the heart of his heavenly father. For we find in John 14, as he speaks to his disciples, you have known me, and if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip says, Lord, show us the father. It'll be enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not come to know me? Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does these works. Believe in me that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me. Otherwise, at least believe the works that I do. His disciples later responded, Oh, now you're speaking clearly, not using figures of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from the Father. The heart of God in the Gospels. To clearly see the heart of God, one need only look at the works of Jesus. Here we see the heart of a heavenly Father who seeks the lost, who restores the brokenhearted, opposes the proud and the arrogant. Perhaps one of the best passages for us is found in John chapter 7. A present day story, we find Jesus declaring himself to be the light of the world. As such, it is seen by many as a consistent pattern of self revelation as revealed in John chapter 8, verse 12. Violating the sanctity of the temple courtyard, these religious zealots have absconded with a woman, a familiar story to all of us, caught in the act of adultery. Presumably the night before was held over until morning when court could be held in session. They care very little about this woman or her fate. It is all about trapping Jesus in an element of theology and Mosaic law and hopefully to publicly humiliate him. You know the story. It's often taught in church. The essence for our purposes is not the fate of the woman or the humiliation of the religious zealots, but rather character, the character of the heart that is openly displayed in Jesus. Remember, to know the heart of Jesus is to know the heart of his Father. Throughout the gospel accounts, we see the heart of God reflected in the the priorities of Jesus' ministry. As Martin Lloyd-Jones noted, the gospel of Jesus Christ is concerned about all of the heart. All of its emphasis is on the heart. The priorities of Jesus' heart are seen in his opposition to the self-righteous and callous disregard of the outcast. They're reflected in his tenderness towards those who are humble and contrite in spirit. His searching the lost, concern for the sick, passion for the disenfranchised and approachability to those who are seeking him. Here we see the heart of the Father in open display. When we look at the heart of God in the historical books, 
As we turn our attention to the historical book of Acts, we see the heart of God as he removes religious obstacles, cultural barriers that form an artificial boundary towards himself and the mankind that he cares so deeply for. Acts chapter 10, 14, we find that Peter has a conversation with God. God rebukes him and says, what I have pronounced as clean, do not refer as unclean. Peter had been so proud of the fact that he had removed himself from everything that was unclean in the world around him. This vision was a revelation to not only Peter, but also for subsequent readers to understand that man-made barriers, such as an association between Jews and Gentiles, did not originate from God, but traditional Phariseeism. God's heart is one of outreach, extended towards all mankind, regardless of cultural ancestry, regardless of geographical boundaries, regardless of gender, age, economic status, and other super superficial forms of distinction. The heart of God in the epistles. We see this obvious theme continue throughout this genre, the New Testament. God crosses over geographic and cultural divides through countless miraculous occurrences in order to reveal himself as a God whose heart is ever reaching out to the lost. Christ living in us Viewed as, viewed as the capstone of the mystery of God by Paul in the book of Ephesians, is testimony of God's resolve to reveal what he had purposed in his heart long before the dawn of time, according to Ephesians 1.4. It's a reminder of what we discovered in the Old Testament regarding the heart of God as one that is steadfast and determined to bring fruition to his plans and purposes. The heart of God was thus fulfilled when Jesus' redemption was made available to mankind. It brought about God's goodness to see this occur in the fullness of time. The book of Revelation. The final biblical genre is found in the apocalyptic writings of the Apostle John. Here we see the unfolding end of the world and the ensuing start of another. God now gathers redeemed mankind to himself and bestows eternal blessings and reward on those who have received his gracious gift of salvation in Jesus. God's heart, his heart is revealed through the culmination of his predetermined plans. His foreordained campaigns are completed and the timing has been known only to himself and is now revealed. Let me wrap up in the last two minutes. It's clear from this brief analogy, this brief biblical theology of God's heart that it's focused on mankind's well-being. When we sin, he's grieved. When we praise and worship him and look for ways to curb our baser desires and obey his distinctives, he's pleased with us. He is pleased in his heart. The heart, therefore, has rightly been described as the mission control and mission center of our life. Perhaps it's fitting to point out as we conclude our time on this discussion that we're told the greatest commandment is that we love the Lord our God with all of our heart. Love in this regard is far more, is far more than an emotional twang, an emotional feeling. It's an intentional and well thought out commitment to form our thoughts our motives, and subsequent actions around that which is pleasing to our Heavenly Father. If God's heart priorities are for mankind to love Him, to worship Him, and to serve Him with a heart that is undivided, then it behooves us to determine those things that are of value to our Creator. After all, who among us would not want to have the moniker, he or she is one who seeks after my heart, said of them. One of my favorite verses, 2 Chronicles 16, 9, reads, the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the whole earth, that he might show himself strong on behalf of, on behalf of him or her whose heart is completely committed to him. It's been my desire to have such a life 
since I made my, that my life verse very early on in my ministry preparations. I have not always passed that test. There have been failures in my life, but I keep coming back to seeking the heart of God as it recalibrates my decision making. In the days going forward, I want to explore the meanings of living that kind of life as a ministry leader. So as I said, tomorrow I want to unpack what it means to, to know the heart of God in relationship to the way in which God wants to prepare you for ministry service. I want to talk after that about the heart of God in relationship to social justice and social engagement. And then lastly, what is God's intention? What is his heart? What is his intentional plans in relationship to the church that you leave here to represent? Would you pray with us together? Father, thank you. Thank you for these passages in your word which help us understand your heart, how you relate to mankind and desire for us to seek the lost, to heal the wounds of those who are broken, and to bring into your presence those who are in need of a relationship with you. It is your predetermined will that God, the Lord Jesus Christ Almighty, would die on the cross on our behalf, and that we as your spokespersons would invite others into a relationship with you through Christ, through the empowerment that you provide in us through the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your revealed will in your word, for how it helps declare your purposes in your heart. Allow us as ministry leaders to be knowledgeable in that word so we might discern with wisdom how to apply it to the culture in which we live. Thank you for this brief glimpse into your heart. Now allow us to live in such a manner that it brings pleasure to you. For I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much.